so welcome to Deschutes Public Library's online programming. You are here for a program as part of our No Deserts, No Desserts program. Uh, and we have invited Dr. Kristen H. Berry tonight to talk about the desert tortoise. Uh, Dr. Berry has degrees, a BA from Stanford University, uh, an MA from UCLA, and a PhD from California, University of California at Berkeley. She grew up, grew up in the Mojave Desert where she enjoyed hunting lizards and tortoises near her home. Her early research was on Chuckwalla lizards. I need to know about those. Um, in the Northwestern Mojave Desert, the topic of her dissertation at Berkeley. Following graduate school, she has conducted research and published on desert tortoises and other vertebrates in the desert, desert vegetation and human impacts. She worked for the Bureau of Land Management, Department of the Interior for more than 20 years, and since 1997 as a principal investigator in the fields of wildlife biology and ecology at the US Geological Survey. Uh, we are so glad you're here tonight, Dr. Barry. I'm gonna invite you to share your screen. So I'm going to talk about the ecology and social behavior of the Agassiz or Mojave Desert tortoise. Um, as Liz Goodrich mentioned, I'm with the US Geological Survey. I'm going to talk about the importance of the desert tortoise, its geographic range and habitats, adaptations for the desert living, social behaviors, and summarize the vulnerable life history characteristics that have caused it to uh, be in such peril. So we start first with why is it important? It's a flagship umbrella and a keystone species in the Mojave and Western Colorado desert. It has large mass, it occupies several habitats and ecosystems and requires large areas in which to live. And that alone makes it a flagship. The protection, by protecting the desert tortoise, we have a positive protection for a lot of other species and that makes it an umbrella species. And then it's a keystone because its burrows are important for a lot of other species and some of which are in decline also. It was declared threatened by the federal government in 1990, uh, but it had been protected in the state of California since 1939. Um, but the formal uh, protective listing as threatened came in 1990. It's recently been treated as a critically endangered species globally by the International Union for Conservation Nature's Red List. Now we move on to the geographic range. And here you see a picture of an adult female tortoise at the Desert Tortoise Research Natural Area. And it's a year with wildflowers. In 2011, 10 years ago, the geographic range of the desert tortoise changed. It once extended, the range once extended from California, Nevada and extreme Southwestern Utah through Arizona down to the state of Sinaloa, Mexico. We have subsequently uh, studied it over the years and we've learned that there's actually three different desert tortoises. The one in Southern Mexico, or the Southern part of the range is actually a thorn scrub and tropical deciduous forest species. But our species, the Agassiz or Mojave Desert Tortoise uh, is found to the west and north of the Colorado River. And the division in the species occurs through these uh, large river systems, the Colorado River being a very important dividing zone. There's a small hybrid zone where it hybridizes uh, rarely with the Sonoran tortoise in Arizona. And that's where the star is. Our third topic is the habitats, where it lives. And this is a complex subject because it occupies two deserts, the Mojave 
and the Western Sonoran or Colorado desert. And within each of the deserts, there are several ecosystems. And the reason that it does occupy these different eco regions is because it can tolerate differences in precipitation, rainfall, and also temperature differences between the, the areas. So I'm going to show you some pictures of habitat, but before I do that, I'm going to point out the, the major deserts in the western part of the United States. At the top, we have the Great Basin that extends into Oregon through Nevada, and then we see the green, the Mojave, and we see the uh, Western Sonoran uh, portion or Colorado desert in orange in uh, California. Precipitation makes a huge difference to where the tortoise occurs. And what you see with the green polygons is where the major populations occur. And what we see is that the winter rainfall that produces the wildflowers that the tortoises eat um, as, uh, is quite different from the western part of the range in California over to Utah. So most of the rain uh, comes, 90% of the rain in the western Mojave comes uh, in winter and produces the spring wildflowers where only 50 to 55% comes in Nevada and Utah. And the same is true going south down into the uh, Colorado or Western Sonoran part of the desert. There's another uh, important factor in these regions, and I'm just giving you a few examples. It's the number of freezing days because this determines whether the tortoise can be above ground and active or it has to be deep in its burrow. And what we see is we have temperature variations in the extreme southern part of the range that go from one to two days, freezing days per year, up to 127 in the northern part of Nevada. And that's a huge range. And so it affects the amount of time it has to spend uh, in shelters. We captured all these differences by looking at, and I by uh, putting together critical habitat for the species. And in yellow, you see the critical habitat that occupies large parts of the desert in California, Nevada, and Utah. These, the protected habitats are shown in blue, such as Joshua Tree National Park, and the rest are shown in yellow. Now we'll look at some examples of habitat. We'll start with the West Mojave, where winter rains produce 80 to 90% of the annual uh, precipitation. And that in turn brings on these great fields of wildflowers, so important as food for the tortoise. In the East Mojave, there's a shrub uh, steppe community with perennial grasses and cactus as well as the creosote bush, which is common to many of the habitats. And in the Northeastern Mojave, we can get into some of the tree yuccas, like the Mojave yucca that we see in the top picture. And in the right, we're seeing uh, Joshua trees and the, the shrub that's dominant below the Joshua trees is black brush. Now we're in the Mojave Great Basin Edge in Utah at the Red Cliffs Desert Reserve where they have protected areas for tortoises. And what you're looking at in the screen on the right or the picture on the right is a sand sagebrush and in the back creosote and then it gets into juniper woodland. Down below, you can see the very rough terrain where the tortoises occur. And they do occur in densities, high densities on those very rough slopes. If we go to the Colorado desert, the Northern Colorado desert has uh, Ocotillo. It has uh, very few freezing days. And it has plants that cannot survive 
when there are many freezing days. And you see two different uh, types of habitat. And now we go to the Eastern Colorado desert and we see a, on the left, an aerial photo of the Eastern Colorado desert and the green washes are strips with microfill woodlands of smoke trees, Palo Verde and ironwood. It's really an incredibly beautiful place and in the areas on the pavement in between these washes, there's Ocotillo and creosote. In the washes, one can often find these vines that creep over the Palo Verde and the ironwood. And uh, there are also some very big rattlesnakes that live in these areas. The fourth topic is adaptations to survive in the deserts. How does this tortoise do it? Well, it has some very severe temperature constraints. It's almost like human beings. These tortoises cannot to uh, tolerate high temperatures such as one can find in many of the desert lizards. And we will talk too about the burrows that it lives in and behavioral and physiological uh, constraints, and especially during drought and annual and seasonal activities, which includes reproduction. So tortoises spend over 90% of their lives underground and it's closer to 95%. And they're in half moon shaped burrows with the uh, burrow the size and shape of the tortoise. And this is a very typical burrow that's in soils. Now the temperatures affect the activity and the shelters and whether the, the shelters or the burrows are shallow and used in winter or whether they're 10 feet long with three feet of soil uh, cover over the top. And so you can see that depending on the number of freezing days, more and more uh, lengthy tunnels one can find in the burrows as one goes north and to the east. But there's also another difference. The tortoises spend a lot of their time solitary in their burrows until one crosses the line, the border from California to Nevada. And at that point, we start to see uh, the tortoises living colonially in complex dens that may be 20 feet or more long with side rooms. And so there could be over a dozen adult tortoises living in one of these at a time. And I'm going to show you on the top picture, one of these communal caves where they were living colonially in Utah. And it's in a wash bank and you can see the shadow up of um, where these burrows are. They're down about three foot feet from the top of the wash. And tortoises also live in rock shelters. And here we see a tortoise that's emerged from a uh, rock shelter. And little baby tortoises live in little tiny burrows. Again, it's half moon shape and it's only, uh, it's flat on the bottom and it may be no more than two inches across. Uh, there's other characteristics that are protective for the tortoise in the heat and in the extremes of temperature in summer and winter. And that is to place the tortoises or place the tortoise burrows under the shrubs or in the drip line. And that way uh, the tortoise can come out and be uh, protected uh, while it's still in the shade and it has some cover. Let's look at drought. How does the tortoise um, deal with drought? And drought we're defining here as one or more dry years. We have to recognize that deserts have drought. It's part of their long-term precipitation pattern. And we measure drought against long-term norms of annual precipitation. 
So tortoises are very heavily dependent on the timing and the amount of rain. And this is for food and for free water that it can drink. It has physiological adaptations to cope with drought. They tolerate high osmotic electrolyte and urea concentrations in the blood, far more than any mammal could, constant, uh, could tolerate at all without dying. And they can also concentrate not only in the bloodstream, but in the bladder. Uh, they lose very little water. They have a low water flux rate during drought because they're staying in their burrows and they're, they have a low metabolic rate too because they're down in the burrows where it's cool. They also don't produce as many eggs. Uh, the females don't when uh, there's a drought. It also affects their behaviors. They spend much more of their time underground during dry years. They may go straight from uh, hibernation, emerge, see there's no plant material to eat, nothing for them to eat, and they'll go back down. And they'll stay there all summer and not come out or only come out briefly, um, unless it rains. So, Tortoises respond rapidly to rain and we really don't know how they know to come out of their burrows and go to a drinking site uh, when we can smell rain coming. Uh, we don't know if they smell it or they sense the change in barometric pressure, but they come out before the rain starts and they will go to depressions or water catchments such as you see in the picture. These are depressions they can self dig or they can go to uh, depressions in rocks. They can climb onto the rocks and drink. As soon as they start drinking, they also release the uh, contents of their bladder, which is when it's very concentrated, it's the color of deep, uh, dark wine. And they will drink uh, out of their mouths and uh, release the water, the, uh, waste water from their um, bladders, and they'll increase their metabolic rate. They'll come out even in winter to get rain, and any time of year, they will come out to drink. And so here you see a picture of a tortoise drinking, and you'll notice its posture. It's got its hind legs straightened, and its face down, in the rock crevices where the water is collecting and it sucks up water through its nostrils, its nares. That's what you call nostrils for a tortoise. Rain affects uh, whether it's healthy, its physiology, its growth, whether it grows, uh, whether it reproduces and how many eggs it can produce, its survival, and its behavior. And we know all of this because of long-term studies uh, related to the years when it's very wet, the El Ninos, and also when it's dry. Now we'll look at annual and seasonal activities and how they're adapted. We will cover uh, seasonal activities, foraging and preferred foods. These are herbivorous animals, growth and reproduction. Here's a schematic of the adaptations for seasonal activities. You can start with winter when the tortoises are hibernating and some people use the term brumation, but I much prefer hibernation. In spring, spring is tortoise time to feed. This is the only time, the most time when they can really tank up and get uh, succulent plant material to eat. Males may try to court the females in, at this time of year, but uh, it's really a no-go. The females aren't particularly interested and the males are not capable of producing sperm at this time. But spring is the nesting time for the females when they lay eggs. In the summer, they mostly spend their time underground, uh, rarely feeding and maybe then eating dried food or forage. Summer is courtship time. 
going into the fall. And this is a very, very important time for the tortoises. It's also a time for drinking rainwater for rains because about 45 to, to uh, 10, well, 10 to 45% of rainfall can occur in the summer. So they may come out to drink. And then of course, this is a very big fighting time. Courting and fighting are uh, connected. So uh, we enter hibernation in the fall and they go through the winter. Juveniles. Now juveniles, because they're so small, they're about one and a half to uh, one and three quarters inches when they're hatched. They can be active much of the year because they can move in and out of their burrows and to be active at cooler temperatures than can the adults. And they can tolerate very quick uh, changes in temperature, like coming out in the winter when it's a nice, warm, sunny day. And because they're so small, they can have a very rapid response to temperature changes. We're gonna move on now and talk about foraging and food preferences. And remember that feeding is uh, in the springtime. And here you see a tortoise preparing to take a bite and you can see its tongue and its bright eyes. And they are very particular in what they eat. They have to eat plants that are low in potassium. And that's why they do not eat the desert shrubs. Those are high in potassium. They'll eat winter annuals, the ones that come after rain in the winter and early spring. Um, they'll eat summer annuals if they're in the part of the desert where there are summer annual uh, wildflowers. There are a very few herbaceous perennials that they eat. And these actually look a lot like um, annuals. And rarely they eat cactus. They also eat grasses, but grasses are not good for them. And I'll talk about that. By far, they prefer fresh, green, and succulent vegetation. And 95% of the bites they take are of uh, fresh, green, succulent uh, vegetation. Here we see a wishbone bush. The legumes, members of the pea and bean family are by far preferred food items, and they will seek these out, go to places where there are lupins and lotus and local weeds, and they will eat these. And why? Uh, why uh, are people encouraged to eat beans? It's because they're high in protein and they're very healthy. So uh, they're, this is a very important food group for the tortoise. They also eat evening primroses. These are low in potassium. And there are several different kinds of evening primroses. And here we see yellow cups. The mallow family is another one that's important. Apricot mallow is particularly important in the Eastern part of the geographic range. And the desert five spot, a very uh, attractive, a very beautiful, uh, mallow, um, often called the globe mallow. You can see the five red spots looking down the throat. And in the cactus family, they will eat the beaver tail cactus flowers and also the very uh, fresh growing uh, little pads of the cactus, not the old pads, but the, the young pads. And they have occasionally been observed to eat um, the pencil cactus, but this is not a major part of the diet. Now, what do these little tiny tortoises feed on? Because they do not have the strength in their jaws or sharp beak to bite the food off. They eat tiny little plants like forget-me-nots. They eat some of the evening primroses that are very delicate that are uh, very close growing to the ground. Everything has to be close to the ground where this little tortoise can see it. 
They will eat storksbill or fillery, the desert dandelion, the white pincushion flowers. And I point the arrow at this, they eat the Arab or Mediterranean grass, an exotic introduced grass. And this is not good for the tortoise. What we do know for both adults and juveniles, that experimental studies have shown that tortoises aren't gonna grow unless they eat the forbs, the wildflowers. Juveniles will actually lose, lose weight. They'll lose nitrogen and potassium on, or phosphorus on grasses. And they'll also lose weight because to eat grass, they have to expend water. And that is a very serious issue. So it affects their growth and it affects whether their shells harden and to become more impervious to the predators. So grasses aren't preferred. They're eaten out of desperation, if that's all there is to eat, especially in a dry year. And some of these grasses are fire prone and they've caused uh, the deserts to burn in the West. They, the deserts did not evolve with these non-native grasses, red roam or cheap grass, Mediterranean grass, you in the Great Basin have a great deal of problem with the red brome and with the cheap grass and with fire in your uh, grouse habitat. Uh, now the non-native or alien annual plants compose about 60% of the biomass in wet years and 91% of the biomass in dry years. And what's happened is they're very competitive with our native plants and they are taking over. And here you see a tortoise, an adult tortoise in a sea of Arab grass. Uh, this is a very serious issue for the West because of the, the fire and also because it's serious for uh, many of the threatened and endangered species such as the tortoise. Now, why should we even be talking about non-native or alien grasses? Why are they important? Uh, they're a serious problem just for the tortoise, just looking at this narrowly, is they're not only not preferred, but they're, the dry matter and energy digestibility is lower than for forbs. So much harder to digest and they provide little or no nitrogen. They cause more water loss than gain and they're fire prone. So those, that's a summary of the problem with these alien grasses. Now we'll talk a little bit about growth and reproduction, growth from the hatchling to adulthood and factors affecting growth, female reproductive cycle, the male reproductive cycle, male female male relationships in the mating system. And we'll turn now to looking at growth and aging. And here we see a baby tortoise just hatched. There's part of the shell on the anterior part. And you see the plates, those are called scoots. And those are the hatchling plates. There are little uh, reticulations on them. You can see the little dots on them. And they will carry those for the first several years of their lives before they rub away. The hatchling survival is very low, very hard for them to reach adulthood. Um, here's a young tortoise showing growth rings. And this, the growth and the number of rings they put on depends on the available food. In drought years, maybe zero, they may not grow at all. So they need years with good wildflowers. And they may grow as much as 20 millimeters a year, the average is nine to 10 millimeters a year. Um, it's very much variable and it takes a long time to reach sexual maturity. So the age and the size, you wonder when they reach the age that they can first begin producing eggs because this is very important for females and for of threatened and endangered species, how long does it take for them to grow up? 
and it depends on the desert region, the rainfall patterns and the food availability and periods of drought. If they have years and years of drought, they're not gonna grow very fast. It's gonna be very slow. The time range is 17 to 21 or more years to reach sexual maturity before they can start breeding and producing eggs. Uh, the size at maturity is seven, about seven inches in the length of the top part of their shell, and that's a straight line distance, not over the top of the dome. And in some areas, such as northern parts of the range, it may be over eight inches before they can reach uh, sexual maturity. And one of the very interesting things is that even when females become very, very old, 60 or 80 years, they're still producing eggs. And the bigger they get, the more eggs they produce. So those big old ladies are very valuable in terms of uh, producing offspring. So here you see a very, very old tortoise where the growth uh, layers have been worn away. And this animal has osteoporosis, but it's still functioning in the environment. Let's look first now at the female reproductive cycle and its adaptations, and we'll turn to the male. Uh, a very interesting thing about tortoises is the male-female reproductive cycles are decoupled. Spring for the female, summer, fall for the males. And this may be a way, since the males are very, very aggressive, uh, of keeping the females safe when it's their egg laying time. Female uh, starts nesting and lays her first clutch or group of eggs in April or May. And if she's going to lay a second clutch, it will probably be in June and July. And she digs the nest with her hind legs and then drops the eggs into the nest. The general knowledge and conclusions we can draw about multi from multiple studies is the number of eggs a female produces is directly related to her body size. Females are known to lay from one to 10 eggs in a clutch and the average is four to five. But the big ladies lay a lot of eggs and the little tortoises, the ones that are just in their late teens may only lay one or two. Uh, the frequency of the total number that they lay, if, if they're going to lay more than one clutch, uh, is higher in wet years, that is years with lots of uh, plants to eat, and lower or zero in dry years. And some females may go more than a year laying no eggs. The eggs are the size and shape of ping pong balls when they're laid. And uh, here's another very interesting thing about tortoises is the sex is determined by the temperature that the eggs are incubated. So they have what's called TDS, temperature dependent sex determination or TSD. Now, how is this determined? The males, if they're incubated at the cooler temperatures below 89 degrees Fahrenheit, um, those cool eggs are going to be males. The females are uh, incubated at the hotter temperatures. And you can think about this as their hot mamas. They're gonna be hot mamas when they grow up. The eggs incubate in the nest from 67 to 104 days. Uh, there's some evidence that may overwinter. And here we see some little tortoises hatching. They have a yolk plug and you can see this uh, yolk plug at the end of the arrow. They will withdraw that in a matter of hours into their bodies and leaving the umbilical scar. They're folded in half inside the egg, they gradually unfold. And then you see on the, the left, the baby tortoise ready to go. 
The yolk pug is an adaptation because uh, these babies are hatched in late summer and fall when there isn't food available. So they're carrying their lunch box with them. Uh, and this is probably a means of having them survive over the winter. Now, nest predation is very high. There are predators like the Gila monster in the eastern part of the geographic range. And just everything likes to eat those eggs. Kit fox, coyotes, uh, badgers, uh, spotted skunks. And there is some evidence that the ravens are digging them up um, and getting the eggs. So, we're very fortunate if a few of the babies can hatch. Let's turn now to the male reproductive cycle. It peaks in late summer and early fall and it's all controlled by testosterone levels. And here you see a figure showing the rise and fall of testosterone. That big wide band from um, orange to yellow. And you will see that testosterone measured in uh, nanograms per milliliter. And in the winter, they're just, there's, we have grave doubts if there's any uh, sperm that the uh, males have. And in spring, their testes are at the low point. They're regressed. It's very uh, expensive metabolically for a male to keep a testis going year round. Uh, especially, this is another important adaptation for living in the desert. And we see it with a lot of uh, desert animals that there's just a, a few months peak for the testosterone level. So the, the uh, testosterone starts rising in the summer and in the late summer and early fall, this is when effective mountings and matings occur. And that's another thing that's very interesting. You may see, and when you're in the desert, um, an adult male mounting a female, but she has a choice whether he mates or not. He might be um, mounted uh, for quite some time, but not get to mate. So it's, um, I had a graduate student studying this, and it's a fascinating topic called female choice. Now there's male to male aggressive behaviors. It's very common in late summer and early fall, and it ties with testosterone. They will attack each other. They raise up off the ground, the, and they use the guler horn, which is right below the chin of the tortoise on the left. You can see that that's part of the undershell and it comes out and it enlarges, it, it becomes very large. It's used like um, a weapon with the males and it's also used in, uh, in uh, courtship with the females. You see, they bite each other and they can take that guler horn and gouge uh, around the head of the opponent. So you can see what that horn can do. And we found males with torn skin and bloody um, above his, the soft tissue above the head. There's another outward sign that the male uh, has that uh, shows that he, that he has high testosterone. And these are the chin glands or mental glands. And the bigger the chin glands, the more testosterone. And they, uh, they enlarge just in summer, they will drain. Um, it may be a means of recognizing sex for the females and for the other males. And I think there's a, there's a scent component to it. So adult male and female interactions in summer and fall, the males spend significant amounts of time uh, visiting and courting females, going to, to visit them at their burrows. They attempt to mate or they will mate with the female. In addition, the females may exhibit choice. They may not come out of their burrows. Or even if they come out and the male wants to court, they may walk away or they may start eating. 
uh, they have a number of ways of being uh, uncooperative if they don't care for the male. Now males have dominance hierarchies uh, with alpha males, and this is size-based with the largest males being the alphas. And this is maintained, the system is maintained by continual fighting. And I'm gonna show you an example. We have the sizes on the left with the smallest tortoises at the bottom and the largest at top. And we're gonna start off with the alphas. Numbers 57, 29, and 43, those have uh, large blue edges. Now we're going to look at who they beat up. And this is, the arrows point to the losers. And we have a case here where number 29 was just a little bit smaller than 51, but 51 had a damaged ghoul horn and wasn't very good at fighting. And he lost every single battle with uh, 29. And here you see smaller males all the way down. Uh, some of these uh, big males were beating up some pretty small males that were uh, young. So now let's look at the relationship of these males to the females. We're talking just about adults here. So here we see a male and a, a female together under a ledge. One of these males has a radio transmitter on it. So now we're looking at male-female relationships. The pink round circles are the females. And notice this female that has a much darker band around it, number 58, and all these arrows in pink are pointing to her. She was a hot, a real hottie. They, uh, whenever a male came to visit, she would come out. She didn't hide deep in the burrow. But the big point I want to make here is even the little males are getting to court the females. And over on the Lower left corner, you'll see 26 and 32. 32 is a very small male, but 26 preferred this male, especially preferred it to number 29. Uh, and I'll tell you more about that because what I want to do is show you a day in the life up the courtship in the summer. And these are based on observations of these individual marked tortoises. And that's why they have the numbers. And we're gonna start at the lower left and we have male 29. And you see he's got a heart shape over his head because he's looking for female 58. And the big, these uh, half moon, brown shapes are burrows. And the big ones are places where the male can get in with the female. But if they're just the pink burrows, uh, the male can't get in. He's got to wait outside. So male 29 uh, started looking for her. He went to her burrows. He knew where she spent time. He found her in a new burrow and he attacked her. And that's why you see the broken heart above. And he buried her with rocks in her burrow. And that's why you see the big star there. I don't know why this happened. I think that uh, she may have had the smell of another tortoise on her shell. And he may have been very angry, but at this time of year, remember the testosterone level is very, very high. And I didn't, I don't think I told you that it is higher than that recorded in any human during this time. So then he turns and he crosses the wash and he goes to look for number 26 and he goes to her burrows from one to another and he finds her down here courting with male 32, the little guy. He quickly beats up. 32, 
32 doesn't put up any resistance and takes off after being beaten up. And uh, female 26 went back in the burrow and she blocked the, the burrow entrance by turning sideways so he couldn't get in in the heat. Remember, these are very hot days and some of these actions occur very early in the morning or late in the afternoon when it's starting to cool off and in the early evening. She finally let him in and the next day they courted. We don't know if uh, he had any success. Now the next day, he, uh, he had disappeared. He'd gone over to another wash system and he came back and he looked 458 again and he found her and they were courting. And at this time, number male 51 comes up and he's guarding her. He's uh, at the entrance watching, doing threat displays. The two of them get into a fight that lasts for one and three quarters hour. These are long fights, 51 lost, had to take off. And shortly afterwards, male 61 comes up. He was dispatched by doing threat displays and head fogs and male 61 left. So we can talk about the mating system. It's a scramble competition system where the male's going from one female to another, trying to keep other males away. The tortoises are both polygynous and polyandrous. And I'll talk more about that in a minute. Females choose, and they may not be promiscuous. Over the years, they may have favorites. There may be pair bonding. And we wonder, and I certainly wonder, what is the role of male dominance if the females get to mate with the little guys? Females have a, a fascinating system where they can store sperm in a special gland, the albumin gland in the oviduct. And they can store it for a number of years. And the result is when the one looks at the genetics of the eggs and the young that are produced, there are uh, multiple fathers. So in this case, we have multiple matings. The females are polyandrous. They can store sperm for multiple years. We don't know how many years. And the eggs uh, can have multiple fathers. Our fifth topic uh, is the vulnerable life history characteristics. Why is this animal in trouble with all the human activities that go on and protection that it has? Well, it's got slow growth and a very long period to reach reproductive maturity, 17 to 21 or more years. And once mature, the females, when they're small, lay very few eggs, especially uh, in their youth. There's a very high predation rate on the young and the juveniles and very low survival in these classes until the uh, tortoise reaches adulthood. But this, the, these little guys are especially um, vulnerable. Now, if one is going to have a stable population of animals, one needs to keep most of those adults alive. Can lose only two per year out of every hundred adults. And then it should be in equal quantities of males and females. Some people have said, well, just keep the adults alive, but they're not going to produce forever. And they have, uh, with human beings, a higher mortality rate. And so survival of the small tortoises is very important because we need to keep bringing those little animals into the population and having them grow up. So the cell, um, there's more in terms of the vulnerabilities. Habitat loss and degradation, I've talked about one source of the degradation. With, the, the, uh, with disturbance comes the, the weeds, but there's habitat loss from roads, from livestock grazing, from recreation activities, from 
and there's loss of individual animals from shooting and collecting. Uh, as we've talked about, there's changes in the food supply and quality. And a very serious issue has to do with uh, elevated predation rates. Of course, in the future, climate warming, drying, and more times of drought. So let's talk now about the predators. Who eats the tortoise, the kit bump, the coyote? And I put the coyote in bold because coyotes are subsidized by human populations from everything from roadkill to garbage and so on. And so their numbers uh, have grown considerably. They're badgers and bobcats and in some parts of the range, mountain lions. The common raven is a uh, extremely serious predator. They have grown from into uh, very large populations. And all of this is, a, is basically a separate subject, but they are killing the baby tortoises. There are rarely any ever found. And now they're, they're killing the adults. They can flip them over and um, using their beaks, pound open the, the tail and the rear end and gut the tortoise. So we talked about uh, the importance of the species, its geographic range, its habitats and how they differ by desert and region, the adaptations that the tortoise has and the many facets of its life cycle social behavior, and the vulnerable life history characteristics. And thank you very, very much. Oh, perfect. OK. So Marilyn, and I think you may have answered this, um, she wants to know what is the size and weight range for adult tortoises? Uh, the adults can get to be 15 inches in carapace length. That's a straight line. And they can uh, weigh probably eight kilograms. OK, thank you. Um, so now I have a couple of questions. So I'm wondering, you, you showed a picture of the habitat um, that had to do with Las Vegas. And I'm wondering about the tortoises in Las Vegas? Well, there used to be some very high densities of tortoises in the Las Vegas Valley and in the surrounding areas. But with the development, those, uh, the home sites of those have been lost and the tortoises are no longer there because they've either been killed or crushed or whatever, or they were translocated. And uh, about 9,000 tortoises that came out of uh, Las Vegas were placed in a uh, translocation site near Jean, Nevada. There only, uh, that occurred over a long period of time from I think 1997 to 2014. And there are fewer than 300 or so left there. So they did not, they did not uh, survive that translocation. Yeah, interesting. You know, humans and the ha human habitat and tortoise habitat is coming into conflict. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. Okay. So, just a, a couple of other things that came up for me. Um, how often do the tortoises leave their burrows to eat during the seasons? Uh, if there are a lot of wildflowers, if the wildflowers are plenty and it's a good spring, what they call a wet spring, the tortoises will be out eating, not quite every day, but they will uh, eat until they can't eat anymore. And we do, we've done studies on bite counts and that's why we know what they eat and how many bites they take and that sort of thing. So they will go retreat to their burrows uh, after a big feed and stay a day or two and then come out and they feed again. And yeah, so that I, I'm super curious about how do you track these tortoises? I mean, are you, do you have 
radio transmitters on them attached to the shell and the receiver radio. So how do you actually do that? How do you attach the radio transmitter? I mean, do you go out, when do you go out and do that? Well, once you get a permit, you have to put it in a proposal for research. It has to be reviewed. It has to be determined that it is something that's important to know. And sometimes uh, there are studies done where the same animals are used for a number of purposes so that uh, we can maximize um, the information and minimize the disturbance to the tortoises. And they're attached with the antenna uh, to the shell with epoxy. And it's a, cert it's a certain kind of epoxy so that it can be popped off when, in two years when the transmitter has to be changed. Now, if you put um, a transmitter on a baby tortoise, it may last only four months. And so uh, we have developed methods such as putting a, a bit of Vaseline in the center of the transmitter and putting the epoxy around the edges and then it'll pop off very easily on one of those little delicate babies. With the oh, very delicate and I, I love that picture of the babies um, in relation to the size of a dime. <laughs> yes. <laughs> those well, little the, babies. Yeah, you know, the bones aren't developed underneath the shell at that point. There's just the, the scoot material, which is like your small uh, finger nail, not your thumb, which would have a heavier nail. But, Think of your uh, fifth finger on your hand and how delicate it is. And that's what a baby tortoise is like. And they're called walking raviolis. Everything <laughs> eats them. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> okay, so I just want to have you last, just do one last wrap up on how important um, these tortoises are to our environment and why they, they, they play a role. And you are really out there protecting and, and understanding the role that they play in our environment. Any last pitch for, for our friends? Well, I think uh, because they're um, a keystone and a flagship, uh, without the tortoises, there are thousands and thousands of burrows that can't be used by a lot of other animals. And birds, we have a scientist who uh, developed a list, put up a, a cam, one of the photo uh, cameras and took pictures of everything that came, every animal that came to the burrow. And there are birds that use it during the hot times of day. And of course, lizards and rodents, spiders <laughs> and uh, scorpions and that sort of thing, but spiders definitely do it. Um, and burrowing owls use the burrows, the kit fox use the burrows and they will take a tortoise burrow and develop it and reshape it to suit them. And if one goes to a kit box den where there's multiple entries, and I had to dig up one of these that was in the path of a freeway, um, there was a tortoise that had come down and was down in the base and there was a kit box there too. And so uh, there are multiple animals that use those burrows. Burrowing owls uh, use them. And we've seen a big male tortoise chase a burrowing owl out of its burrow. <laughs> well, they're amazing um, animals. And thank you so much, Dr. Barry, for joining us here tonight. Um, everybody who is on the call is gonna get a, um, an eval, um, a link to an eval to, to share what they, want to say tonight about our program. Um, thank you, Ms. Morton, for your interpretation tonight. And thank you so much, Dr. Barry, for bringing your wisdom and your information about the desert tortoise. So important. Thank you. Thank yeah. you for the opportunity.